Peeps, today we're going to be talking about your plumbing apprenticeship and what to expect. I'm Kenny Molotov, licensed plumber, professional magician, and entertainer. On this channel, I go through the ins and outs of my career in plumbing. I take you through a day in the life and we talk tools, theory, and mindset. I'm trying to give you an arsenal of knowledge and an online resource so you can take this trade head on and find yourself successful on the other end. Click subscribe, hit that bell notification, and let's talk pipes. Peeps, Kenny Molotov here in the studio and I wanted to bring up a topic that's really important to a lot of you trying to get into the trade and that is your plumbing apprenticeship and the sorts of things you can expect as you progress through it. So these are just a few tips that I wanted to go through with you all so that you understood a typical progression of an apprenticeship is and if you're on the right track. See, I remember when I was first starting out in plumbing, I came to realize that a lot of things were happening to me and I didn't know whether they were normal or whether this was just a situation between my father and I, and it wasn't until I went to school and I met other plumbers that we started having conversations, and I came to realize, oh, you know what? That's happening to a bunch of us, actually. So I wanted to go through a few of these things so you knew what exactly is in store for you as you're getting into your apprenticeship. So the very first thing I noticed from my peers when we were talking about things in school was that a lot of people actually had quite a difficult time getting into an apprenticeship. It's an interesting phenomenon that occurs, but I wanted to bring it up so you knew that it was sort of the, the hardest part for a lot of people. There were people that had a really hard time getting into their apprenticeship, and then you met a lot of people that were doing plumbing for a really long time, but didn't sign up into their apprenticeship until much, much later, like almost to the point where they had their 9,000 hours already documented, and then they started actually signing up as an apprentice, and this happens a couple of different ways. Sometimes you'll find that some plumbing companies don't actually want to hire you as an apprentice and that could be because you're totally green and then other plumbing companies don't want to get you to go through your plumbing apprenticeship because down the road they know that once you get licensed you're gonna be expecting top dollar with that license so I mean there are those motivations out there I just want you to be prepared for them in case you do run into companies like that if there is a company or individuals trying to hold you back from doing something that is good for you and good for the company in the long run, then you really have to sit back and start considering what are the motivations of these individuals. So now that I brought that up and you sort of know about that and you can pay attention to it, I'm going to move forward, but that's something I want you to pay attention to and make sure you have in the back of your mind. You're trying to join a company and an establishment that wants both the company development and your own personal development. That is the best for both worlds and that's usually a symbiotic relationship where everybody's happy. So the next stage sort of of your apprenticeship and what to expect is the moment you get signed as an apprentice and you're totally green, that is the moment where the work begins and you are not going to be touching a lot of tools. You're not going to be doing a lot of the main sort of work. You're going to be doing the background work for a lot of this time. So that means you're going to be cleaning fittings. You're going to be cleaning job sites. You're going to be running out to the truck to get the appropriate tools. You're going to be running downstairs to make sure that somebody can pass you a pipe through a wall. I mean, there's a lot of things that you're going to be doing and it's going to be more on the manual labor side than it is going to be on the skilled trade side, if you know what I'm saying. So for me, when I first got into my apprenticeship, it was a couple of years till I legitimately did something where my journey person was just standing there watching me do it. You know what I mean? Especially when you're charging by the hour, it's a little bit difficult to justify to the customer that you have the slow apprentice with zero experience doing a job that would take an experienced plumber three or four hours to do because now you might even double that to six to eight hours you know what I'm saying so it is difficult at the beginning but it's quite common to not get your hands on the tools don't be too discouraged about it you are getting to that point but at this point you're literally at the developing stage and that's cool that's the beginning stage and it's something for you to expect so the third thing that you need to expect is that you're going to be facilitating the journey person's ability to to do a lot of the work. This sort of touches on the previous point, but what I'm trying to say is, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine that works for the union, and the union was making sure that it was the apprentices moving tools around. And the reason why they made sure of that was because they didn't want to pay the top dollar of the journey person for them to be taking the tools and moving them upstairs. They were constantly getting the apprentices to do that work. So a lot of times, as I said before, you're going to make sure that the journey person can actually get the job 
job done. So if you gotta run out to a supplier and pick up, you know, a gasket, cause you're missing a gasket, that is your job, that's what you have to do. And same thing with moving tools, and same thing to running to the trucks, and same things with all those sorts of things. Your main job is A, to cut your teeth, to start getting your foot in the tray, to start becoming acquainted with the tools and the materials on the job site, but on top of that, to make sure that you are doing everything in your power as a team to make sure that the job's getting done, and a lot of that is you being the behind the scenes. You're the person pulling the curtains, you know what I'm saying? And the journey person is the one, I guess, in the lead role. The fourth thing to expect is that typically for people that get into the trades, a lot of us that got into the trade were not fit for the trade. And I mean that in a lot of different ways. I, I mean mentally fit to be able to problem solve on the job site and to understand what's going on in the job site. Safety awareness, just knowing things to touch, things not to touch, uh, where to not step, where to make sure that you're not underneath certain things. Physical fitness as well. I mean, one thing that I noticed, even though I was a young lad, I was 26 when I first started my apprenticeship, started working with my father, I came to realize my father, who's 25 years my senior, was outworking me, outpacing me. I mean, he was a beast. And it wasn't until many years later that I came to realize that what my father had was A, a problem solving ability that was much faster than mine, which made him kind of become more efficient at expelling energy. But also two, he was work fit and he is work fit. And that's an entirely different fitness level than it is going to the gym. There is a cardiovascular element to this sort of work and you will notice who can last longer on the job site. And it's people that have been doing this job for a particularly long time that they have a fitness level of being able to do 12 hour days, which is super impressive, really hard on your body. I remember in my first year of my apprenticeship, dad and I had so much work and he was so backed up with work that we ended up doing a two week stretch with maybe one day off in the entire two weeks. Actually, no, we almost went three weeks once anyways. What I came to notice though was that I was destroyed every day and my dad would get into these job sites and every day he would throw in another eight to 10 hour to 12 hour day and he was doing it at this like super efficient pace where he's not sprinting through it but he had that strong steady kind of workforce and he was just creating and building so fast and so well and so efficiently and I was totally wiped and every day I turned to him going how are you doing this can we please take tomorrow off and he'd say stuff like look I can't I I'm so backed up I gotta continue doing it but it was really inspiring at the same time because I'm younger I should be fitter than this man but he was taking me to town man he was making an amateur out of me which is exactly what I was so there is a such thing as fitness in the trades and and being worth it is something that takes years to develop. It takes years to develop the muscles to lift a lot of things. I remember picking up toilets at the beginning. I would shake because it's such an awkward moment. Like you're sort of, I, I could do it with this chair actually. You're always hunched over this toilet and you're picking it up in almost this vulnerable position. And I remember at the beginning, I used to shake doing that because the muscles that you're using in this awkward sort of position aren't being used like that except when you're picking things up in this sort of manner. And for most of us, we don't pick things up in that manner. So it was a big learning curve in regards to the fitness. And the great part about it is once the fitness kicks in, then you really allow your mind to become more efficient at problem solving. So there's this back and forth between your mind being efficient and your body being efficient and you're trying to get both your body and your mind to be at the same level of efficiency. So you're problem solving fast and you're also really fast at that job because you've done it so many times. So before you know it, you actually solve the problem within a half an hour where it would have taken you an hour and a half to two hours a couple of years before and all of a sudden you're on another job site going, wow, this day's going by really fast. I'm on my third job already and it's not even noon. What's going on here? So that is something to expect. You're going to be super slow at the beginning. You're going to probably be super unfit and your journey person is probably going to be outworking you. And for me, at least I know for me, I was slowing my father down for the first few years, especially when he was finally giving me something to do. He'd sort of sit back going, man, hurry up, you know, and he wasn't saying it to me, but it was coming out in his actions and his expressions, which is something you have to juggle. And the fourth thing that you have to sort of be prepared about is the dynamics on the job site. Some job sites are better than others, some are pretty rough, some are pretty good, and it, it really depends on the camaraderie of the crew. But what you have to realize
realize is sometimes you come into a job site where you have a lot of people that are kind of frustrated right from the get-go because the foreman might be coming down on them, project manager might be doing so, and you know, and it sort of gets passed around. And that is something that's common. There are other job sites that you come onto where everybody's super sweet. You notice a camaraderie right away. You feel comfortable with asking people questions and whatnot. What you have to make sure in this phase is that you're sticking to the game plan, which is you're trying to be a good listener, you're trying to take direction well, and you're trying to do everything in your power to facilitate the journey person doing the job. That is what you need to do in those instances right there. Another thing you gotta realize is that because you're new on the job site, you'll be doing things that you might not wanna be doing, so you might be doing coffee runs for people. Uh, that's sort of how it happens in, in the hierarchies, right? When you first start off, they go, oh, the new guy's gonna get the coffee or the new guy's gonna run to the supplier or whatnot, so that dynamics there as well. And sometimes you got people that treat you rough just because you're new, and, and that is something that might happen on a job site, but uh, you know, stay in your lane. Keep to yourself, stay in your lane, try to avoid people like that, and that's sort of what you have to do when you're encountering things like that as well. But then I wanna talk about one of the later stages, which is you start going to school, you start learning more, start understanding more, you start finding yourself in the conversation and useful in the conversation. People are finally asking you to come to jobs with them, they like the way you work, and you also start to realize that, oh man, you know, I put this toilet in a bit faster than the last time. Oh, oh yeah, I could put in a new cartridge for that shower control valve, etc. So you're starting to get right up that hill, almost getting over the hump, you know what I'm saying, of, of the learning curve. And that starts to happen and it starts to get really exciting. And that for me was towards the end of my apprenticeship. One thing I have to say about my apprenticeship and the plumbing apprenticeship I went through was that school was a really big development stage for me. Every time I went to school, I had my mind blown with just the engineering of plumbing systems and the vast amount of things you need to know to get your red seal here on Ontario, Canada. It's so vast. And even to this day, you can go into different types of plumbing if you're not interested in one type. If you go into rural plumbing, there are tickets that you can get there so you can get septic tank ticket. If you wanna get into water treatment, that's an entirely different field of plumbing that you can get into. If you wanna work specifically in the high rise sector, you can do that. I mean, it's so vast and so amazing that even if you don't like the place you started off initially, there's always place for movement. You might wanna get into residential, you might wanna get into commercial, you might wanna do things even bigger than that. The options are quite vast and that's the really impressive part about getting into the trades. There are so many ways you can go with this knowledge. So peeps, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it shed some light on the sorts of things that you can expect in your plumbing apprenticeship. Let me know down in the comments below if there are things that you experienced that I might not have brought up. Like, subscribe, comment below, and I'll see you plumbers very soon. Kenny Molotov, guys. Peace, baby. I can tell you on me, but don't make a move. That will only scare me. This love is just for you. Yeah, I got my reasons why I can't receive. I'm too messed up to believe.